Hello, everybody. Hey, before we get started, can I get everyone to make sure your doors are shut and your other devices are turned off? I'm going to cover quite a bit of information in a short period of time, so I'll need your full attention. Also, everyone on this call will receive a copy of the, of the training at the end of the broadcast. Uh, my name is Chris Duffield, and I'm an account executive for New Line Mortgage. For about the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about compensating factors and how to build a case for your loan. Also, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment and ask for your business. As an AE, I'm paid commission, so the best compliment you can give me is to send me a loan. If you find this training useful and learn something new, please send me a loan on any product. Uh, New Line does offer some great FHA, VA, conventional, and USDA pricing right now. I also have uh, trainings on these subjects and many other subjects. Um, I've got a blog that I've started, and at the end of this training, I will show you the link so that you can go on and become a member of my blog. Uh, my trainings have all been recorded and uploaded. And you can go to the blog, listen to any training that you want to, print and download the material and some of the tools I've created. Uh, they're designed to be quick trainings um, that uh, you can review anytime, whether you're new to a particular subject or want a refresher. They're only 15 to 30 minutes long. They're free. There's a ton of, of, uh, of uh, subjects. I just wanted to create some kind of a forum where you guys can go and get quick, easy, free training on information that actually matters today and can help you get your business done today and your loans done today. So I'll show you that link at the end of this broadcast. Um, let's dive in, compensating factors. So we're going to talk about compensating factors, how to build a case for your loan. Compensating factors are used to help offset layers of risk. For example, a loan that exceeds debt-to-income ratio guidelines is considered a higher-risk loan. And depending on the other layers of risk, the high DTI might be reason enough to decline your loan. So compensating factors can reduce those layers of risk and give reason enough to approve a loan. Uh, the DTI is a perfect example of how compensating factors should be applied. Uh, our underwriters receive calls every day asking, what is your max DTI? Uh, we do have guidelines, but those can be exceeded depending on the compensating factors. There's no real way to answer that question without reviewing a full credit package. We do give our best guess, but that's really all it is, is a guess. The more accurate answer, excuse me, a more accurate answer can be given if you've got compensating factors outlined you know, in a cover letter or in an email, you know, however you're presenting your question or your scenario to your underwriter. Compensating factors, you know, should exceed normal guidelines. Um, the most common compensating factors we see are high FICO reserves and time on job. I should say those are the most common that are presented to us. So we'll get, say, a DTI question, hey, I've got a 55% DTI with an 850 FICO and, you know, two months reserves and 10 years on the job. we got to know that having good credit, a steady employment history, and money in the bank is a basis for loan qualification in the first place. A high FICO may mean the borrower has never been late on anything, but the borrower could still be a heavy credit user, or they may have a lot of recent debt, or their depth of credit may not be that ex extensive you know, to warrant a high DTI. Uh, there are factors in the credit history, however, that we can use, but a high FICO is not a compensating factor. And then required reserves. Some loan programs require reserves, and those, res those requirements are a basis for qualifying for the loan in the first place. Now, if you've exceeded reserve requirements, then that could be considered a compensating factor. And then time on the job may mean that the buyer has steady employment, but that's a requirement for a loan in the first place. You know, it may also mean, you know, if your borrower has been on the job 10, 15, 20 years, they could be close to capping out their income if they haven't already. You know, and, and why would we want to go with a high DTI on somebody who has capped income? 
So it's not necessarily, you know, a, a big compensating factor. So, so let's run through a list of what are considered compensating factors. The borrower has successfully demonstrated the ability to pay housing expenses equal to or greater than the proposed monthly housing expense for the new mortgage over the past 12 to 24 months. So, you know, you need to be able to document these compensating factors, and if you can document with canceled checks, that's the best thing you can do. You can go back and get bank statements if you want to for 12 or 24 months. Um, or if perhaps your borrower is renting and the landlord is willing to provide a letter, and of course the landlord is not related to the borrower in any way, you know, those are, that, those are ways you can document it, but that's a great compensating factor. They've already established the ability that they can make this payment. If you can't verify it, then it's, it's rumor. You know, it's, it, you've got to be able to, to verify it. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, you just got to be able to verify it. Otherwise, it's considered a rumor. Another compensating factor is the borrower makes a large down payment maybe 10% or more towards the purchase of the property from seasoned funds, not gifted. Okay, so a large down payment is a compensating factor. And, you know, if maybe the required down is three and they're putting five down, that's not a big compensating factor. But if the required is five and they're putting 10 down, you know, I would say 10% is kind of the benchmark for a good compensating factor, and it needs to be seasoned. It doesn't really, you know, work if, if the funds are, are getting a gift because it's not necessarily the borrower's funds. You know, they still don't have as much skin in the game, per se. So larger down payments, that's a good compensating factor. Uh, the borrower has demonstrated an ability to accumulate savings and a conservative attitude towards the use of credit. So if you can document, and this may take some bank statements over a period of time, you know, I would say maybe the 12 to 24 mark again, and in those bank statements you can see, a, you know, consistent deposits into the savings account. That's almost like a debt, you know, you can actually, when you're working, on establishing, say, alternative credit, savings is actually, you know, regular savings deposits is actually a great compensating factor, and it kind of shows alternative credit. They've put $500 a month away for the last, you know, 24 months. You know, maybe, they're, maybe they can't budget for that anymore because of their new house payment, but certainly you know, they're able to budget and, and meet within that budget and, and perform. So that's huge. You know, I, I've seen that quite a few times. Another good compensating factor is previous credit history shows that the borrower has the ability to devote a greater portion of income to housing expense. So maybe they've already always operated on a high DTI level. Okay, um, you know, that would be documented, of course, by documenting the housing expense and taking a look at their credit history over the last, you know, 12 to 24 months and kind of coming up with what their DTI has been as, as opposed to what it's going to be. And, you know, letters from your borrower addressing these issues are huge. You know, your, your borrower does or can have some say in their loan, and the more information the borrower is willing to give, the more the underwriter is willing to listen. It means a lot to an underwriter when the borrower takes the time to write these letters, perhaps provide a budget, you know, talk about how they've been able to accumulate the savings and what their new budget is once they have the loan, um, you know, what it's been like them for the last two years, already having a high DTI, you know, what they've been able to accomplish and, and what they see going forward, um, you know, their commitment to the property. 
the, that, that can't, an underwriter will listen to that and you'll build a level of trust in your underwriter by having your borrower help you with these and providing as much documentation as you can. Other compensating factors, the borrower receives documented compensation or income not reflected in effective income but directly affecting the ability to pay the mortgage, maybe including food stamps or similar public benefits. You know, basically if there's income in the file that's documented but we can't use it, maybe there's not a long enough history, um, maybe it's something like food stamps that we don't count normally as income, then that's a great compensating factor. So overtime, you know, if they haven't earned overtime long enough to use it, but it's there and it's documented and it's likely to continue and your employer has helped you, you know, again, if the employer can get involved and, you know, talk about, obviously a lot of employers are hesitant because they don't want to commit to anything, but, you know, if your employer is willing enough to get involved and talk about things like overtime or bonus or things like that, that you know could potentially affect the borrower's future income in the positive aspect, then you know we'd, we'd want those letters. Um, you, you know you really do have to document your compensating factors. Uh, maybe there's only a minimal increase in the borrower's housing expense. I think we kind of talked about that already in the first bullet point. You know that they, they've already had the ability to, to uh, demonstrate an ability to pay a housing expense equal to or greater than the proposed. Um, the buyer has substantial cash reserves, at least three months PITI above the required after closing. Okay, so whatever's required, if you can get at least three months PITI over and above that, that's a significant compensating factor. And what you want to include as reserves is a liquid asset. So um, cash is not acceptable. Uh, checking and savings is acceptable. Uh, 401k, you know, that is kind of borderline because it's not, it takes 30 days to liquidate a 401k and you don't get full access, um, you know, or we don't apply, for, we only apply 60% basically of the balance as a reserve, but it, it's not bad, you know, it's not as strong as uh, stocks or, or uh, checking or savings, you know, but it's there. So, you know, get with your borrower and make sure you understand where all the assets are coming from. Um, the more the better, and like I said, 401k, that's more of a last resort type asset if there are other liquid assets available and documentable. Okay, um, you can't, yeah, and cash reserves, you, you know, can't be gifted and you can't borrow against assets for your cash reserves. So, again, if you're using cash reserves as a compensating factor, it just has to be from the borrower's own funds and seasoned. If the borrower has substantial non-taxable income um, or if we made no adjustment prior to the uh, ratio computations, that could be a compensating factor. If the borrower has a potential for increased earnings, you know, as indicated by job training or education in the borrower's profession, um, maybe they're due for a raise in the near future, uh, those things are, are definitely compensating factors. You know, the employer does kind of have to help us out with those um, and does have to provide some documentation or maybe a letter of explanation on the potential for the borrower's increased earnings. I did have one recently, um, uh, a journeyman plumber, and as he was completing training, he was receiving bonus income, and at the end of all of his training, he was you know, due to receive uh, an income in, or an increase in his overall wage. And that was something the employer was willing you know, to put in writing for us, and it definitely helped offset a high DTI that we were working with. So those are, you know, that, that is possible to document. Uh, maybe the home is being purchased as a result of relocation of the primary wage earner. 
And the secondary wage earner has an established history of employment and is expected to return to work. And reasonable prospects as exist for securing employment in a similar occupation in the new area. Um, we used to call that trailing spouse income. And we don't allow that anymore. Um, but it's definitely a good compensating factor. And then overall, if you're looking at a credit report and you've got a borrower with some short-term debt and they're a minimal credit user overall, you know, they, 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 they have their basics, you know, car loan, one or two, credit card, one or two, and, you know, that's about it. And, you know, that's what they've had over a period of time. That goes, uh, that goes a long way with the underwriters as well. So these are the factors of the loan that should be brought to our attention. You know, the, the high FICO, the reserves, you know, the minimal reserves, the time on the job. Like I said, those are most commonly presented to us. Really, you know, you should throw those three things out and start focusing on this list that we just went over, and that's what you should present to us. You'll end up doing less shopping around. If you came to an underwriter and you had this kind of a list and you've done your research of compensating factors, you know, that, that alone goes a long way with the underwriters. A lot of times we're actually put in a position where we're forced to ask about this. You know, we'll, we'll get um, a scenario with a high DTI and basically no compensating factors, you know, and we'll start to ask about them. You know, so what are some of the other compensating factors of this loan? And we might get a little more information and then we come back with some more questions and then a little more information maybe a couple more questions, and then maybe, you know, we'll say, okay, well, that sounds like something we can work with, you know, and then we get the file in and nothing is documented, or maybe only one of the compensating factors is documented, you know, and, and that puts everyone in a very difficult position, you know. So, and underwriters recognize this, you know, they, they recognize and, and remember this. So, if, if you can spend more time up front and get this information, you know, your answers will come a lot quicker, you'll have a lot more workable underwriters, and uh, you'll save a lot of time. And let's talk a little bit about extenuating circumstances, because this is kind of a, a form of compensating factors, but it's relative to credit only. Extenuating circumstances should be non-recurring events that are beyond the borrower's control that result in a sudden, significant, or prolonged reduction in income or a catastrophic increase in financial obligations. Some loans have credit issues causing the loan to be declined, but if there is enough extenuating circumstances, a lender may approve the credit. Please know that credit must stand on its own. You cannot use any of the previously discussed compensating factors to offset credit issues. Compensating factors should be in addition to extenuating circumstances. Underwriters, again, are asked all the time if we can work with bankruptcies and foreclosures and short sales less than the required waiting period. Uh, they're really given much information about the situation. You know, we do have our guidelines, but we can sometimes work with borrowers that have extenuating circumstances and compensating factors. Um, the documentation of extenuating circumstances should include a signed written statement from the borrower in their own words, third-party documentation confirming that this was an isolated occurrence that significantly reduced the borrower's income and or increased their expenses, no evidence that the borrowers had unacceptable credit prior to the problems, evidence that the borrowers have reestablished acceptable credit with at least four references for at least two years, including one housing-related reference, if a VOR is used, it must be supported by canceled checks. Evidence on the credit report and other credit documentation that the borrower's present credit is current. Evidence that there is no new public records, no 60-day late payments, no more than two 30-day late payments, and no housing lates exist for the most recent 24 months. You know, and, and that could vary depending on the situation that we're working with. And then, of course, we always need an AUS approval. We don't manually underwrite loans. So whatever we're working with, we have to have an AUS approval. That goes for a high DTI as well. So some of these things, you know, can be uh, brought forth on a credit report. 
Uh, you may have to go and get additional documentation, you know, especially if you're trying to document that isolated occurrence, you know, what happened, if there was um, a job loss, um, more because of layoffs than anything, um, or some kind of an injury, you know, or a family emergency, something like that. Uh, documentation could get tricky. Um, Third-party letters, you know, could help depending on the source. Um, newspaper clippings, um, CPA letters, you know, things like that uh, can can all help. And um, and really, you know, a, a careful analyzation of the credit report is is crucial because we'll match the explanation and the documentation to the entire credit history meaning the credit history prior to the problem, the credit history during the problem, and the credit history after the problem. And, you know, it needs to be an isolated problem that's likely to not recur. Okay? Um, and those are extenuating circumstances. So building your case. Build your case before you shop. You will save time shopping around for lenders that will work with your high DTIs and credit issues if you take time to build your case. Take your time and interview your borrower thoroughly so that you know what you're working with and what you can document. The key will be in the documentation. You have to prove all of your compensating factors and extenuating circumstances. There may be times upon spending that extra time with your borrower where, where you'll realize that you don't have a case. You know, maybe you can't document it. Maybe it doesn't quite jive for you now that you've really sat down and thought about it. Uh, you know, maybe it's leaving you with some questions. Maybe it's not an isolated incident. Maybe there's just not enough compensating factors to warrant that DTI. You know, maybe it is just, maybe you realize it is just too high for them. You know, but take the extra time, you know, keep a list of these compensating factors and extenuating circumstances around and, Talk about each of them with your with your borrower and, and say, hey, can you know we build a case around this, or can we build a case around this, or can we build a case around this? You know, and if you're if you're discovering that you can't and you don't have a case, I think that's okay because you really haven't wasted anybody's time and, and I'll bet you've educated the borrower somewhere in the process and you can work on what's next. You know, what can they do to qualify in what period of time? I mean, the point is, is, you know, a quick no is a lot better than a long, drawn-out no. You know, I, I, I've been there. I've done that. You know, and the quicker that you can give an educated no, you know, your borrowers will trust the no if you've spent enough time with them and you guys are truly on the same page and you know the answers to all your questions and they understand where you're coming from and why you have to build this. I mean, you might even want to sit down and kind of go through this training with them you know, um, maybe recreate it, make it your own a little bit, and just kind of say, hey, this is a little bit harder loan, it's outside of the box, you know, these are the things I have to work on um, to present a case to my lender, you know, how can you help me, what can we do? And gosh, they may even bring us in things you don't know about and didn't think to ask about. So spend that time with them, and you can do that up front, or, you know, another option is to, you know, spend all the hours shopping around for lenders, you know, if, if you're calling out or emailing out and, and you're giving limited information, you know, you're just, you're going to get limited answers and you're going to get a lot of back and forth and chances are that could turn into a loan with a lot of conditions and as they're working through the conditions, you find out, oh my gosh, you know, I can't document these compensating factors. I no longer have a case. The deal is dead. So, you know, kind of weigh your options and, and, and see, you know, what, what kind of perception your borrower would have depending on what option you choose. You know, I think spending more time with them up front and really working with them and requiring that they get you some documentation up front, I think that's, you know, where, where I would go. I think their perception of, of your work and knowledge and your relationship would be a lot better under those circumstances. You know, in shopping your scenario, Present the 1003, present the credit report, list your compensating factors and your extenuating circumstances. Use a lot of the verbiage we've talked about today. Wow, that goes a long way with your underwriters. When they can hear that you know what you're talking about 
and you know you've taken some training and you know what you know you're, you're speaking the same language wow are you going to get a workable underwriter you know so put that all together and include that in your scenario um, and and you really will maybe only shop one to two lenders you know tops if you've got you know that strong of a case that's been that well thought out you'll just you'll get a lot more workable lenders and that's really my spiel today for compensating factors. Um, here's the link to the blog I was talking about. Um, again, you'll get a copy of this training, so you'll get a copy of this link. But if you click on this, well, it's actually going to make me log in because I'm already a member. But what it's going to do is it's going to take you to a WordPress page that looks similar to this one. And you have to create a login for WordPress. My blog is not public. I, I'm not making it available to the public. It's a private blog. Uh, you have to be a user, uh, an authorized user, in order to access the information. But once you get in there, I'll show you what it looks like. I'll try and show you what it looks like. I may have typed my password too quickly. You know, and sometimes it does that. It makes me log in twice. All right, so once you get into my blog, um, I've kept it I've kept the format very simple so that it's easy to navigate. What 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 you see on this home page is just all of my blogs in the order that they've been posted. And then of course there's a list of recent posts over here. Um, if you're looking for something specific, what I've started to do, and I'm adding new trainings every week. Um, but I've broken them out into different categories. So I've got FHA training, which covers all your FHA uh, basic products. And then uh, full doc VA training. This is actually a, well, let me just click on it real quick. So FHA training, you can see in here, I've got the FHA purchase pre-qualification process. That's the only training I have. This is a great training. If you're new to FHA purchases, um, it will, it does take you through the entire pre-qualification process, which basically covers all of FHA's underwriting guidelines. Okay. And then I've got the full doc VA training. So this is a 12-part training, plus I recently added VA cash out guidelines. Uh, but this is a 12-part training for new loan officers and new processors to uh, full doc VA purchase loans. And whether you're new or you need a refresher, it's a great, like I said, 12-piece training that starts from the pre-qualification process and runs all the way through to closing funding. So I start down here with uh, pre-qualification questions and then the disclosures, forms, and tools you'll use during the pre-qualification process. 1003 comprehension, um, there's a two-part class there. Uh, credit analysis, LP analysis, employment and income analysis, asset analysis, Con the purchase contract analysis, the appraisal analysis, title report analysis, and then the closing and funding process. So it's pretty pretty comprehensive. And uh, I would start at training one and go through 12. And then I've got all of our high balance products here for conventional FHA and VA. I decided to make a high balance category than to separate these out into the FHA, VA, and conventional categories. They're just all under their own. 
And then um, I've got processor and loan officer training. Uh, that includes today's training and then previous trainings that I usually do on Thursday afternoons. Uh, like last Thursday, we did limiting conditions, understanding the underwriting process, uh, purchase contract analysis, basic income calculations. That's a good one because you get this great little worksheet. Um, and then the last category I think I have is USDA. And again, uh, the training I have in there is the USDA pre-qualification process related to purchase. If you're new to USDA, this is a great training, lots of good information. All right, you guys, well, that's it. I appreciate your time today, and um, look for a copy of this training. Sign up for my blog. Have a great afternoon.